Does borrowing to invest make sense with high interest rates? So this is a question I've been asked a few times lately. We were spoiled there for a few years with interest rates being so low. So borrowing to invest seemed like such a such a simple thing because the hurdle rate to, to make money was so low. But, you know, this year rates, uh, the bank prime started at 2.45. It's now 5.95. So interest rates are three and a half percent higher. Does borrowing to invest still make sense? So what we're going to learn today is how to borrow, inve to, borrow to invest effectively. And borrowing to invest, I also, it's the, the technical term for it is leverage. So I'm going to sometimes use that term here. Uh, what happened with leverage in past periods of high interest rates? How high can interest rates go and borrowing to invest is still beneficial? Uh, I, I'm going to give you my rule of thumb for the break-even point uh, of borrowing to invest. How high can rates go? I'll give you my, I have a rule of thumb for it. Uh, what's the mindset you need to borrow uh, to borrow to invest effectively and what is the best tax deduction after rsp for high income people so i'll talk a little bit so if you've got a high income how do you get a deduction other than rsp so we're going to talk about that so all right so first of all borrowing to invest effectively um the the uh, part of it is is you need investments that you're very confident in the long-term growth and something that's quite tax efficient. And you know, the best choice really by far is stocks or the stock market or, you know, equity funds or something where you're getting the full growth of the stock market over the long term. Okay. And so you don't want, you know, like, like you may invest other money with asset allocations of some stocks, some bonds of cash. It doesn't really make sense to borrow to invest in fixed income like bonds or cash. Two reasons. One is probably you're borrowing at a higher rate than you're getting on the investment. And secondly, there's no tax advantage, right? So you're the interest part you pay full tax on all the time. So it's just a straight loss. So um, in fact, I think I think of borrowing to invest almost like a negative or a more than 100% allocation. So for example, you can be 60% stocks, 40% bonds. You go all the way up to 100% stocks, zero bonds. Now, let's say you go up to 150% stocks, negative 50 bonds. That's kind of what... Um, that's kind of what borrowing to invest is. So the fixed income part is now something that you borrow, not invest in, and you have more money. So it's more of other people's money. That's why it helps you grow grow wealth a lot. But so then you you, you think of it as um, more aggressive than 100% equities. So this is only this is a strategy that works really well for people that are long-term investors and invested for growth and have the risk tolerance and can tolerate this over the long term. So the most effective way to invest, 100% stocks, invest focused on growth, not on income or dividends or something else, focus on growth, and then try to get tax-efficient investments, try to invest in a tax-efficient way, because it really helps um, make it long time more effective. Now, with today's interest rates being somewhat high... Um, Having been around for a while, I've actually seen, you know, they're not actually that high uh, compared to historical rates. So back in the 90s, um, um, I was the uh, I was asked by there was a guy named Talbot Stevens who wrote a book called Conservative Leverage, and he sent it to me to review before it was published. So I was got, I listed as one of the reviewers, and I still remember that. So he was advocating just borrowing a small amount to invest, just to you know amount that you're not worried about. But his book, all the examples in there were about borrowing to invest at 9%. And he had all kinds of stats about how that still works well. So you're borrowing at 9% and it still makes money over time uh, because, of, because of the way that the after-tax return of the stocks compared to the bonds. So um, now if you go back further, you know, back in the early 80s, I was actually um, a controller at a savings and mortgage company back in the early 80s, 1982 at the very peak of the market. And, you know, Interest rates actually got over twenty percent, so it was nuts. You think of borrowing at twenty percent, you know, to to invest. That's that's quite a different animal. So, however, you know, at that period of time, um, uh, interest rates were only above twelve percent. The bank prime was only above twelve percent for four years. So, you know, if you're a long term investor and there's a short blip where it gets above above uh 12% and it comes back down it doesn't necessarily 
kill the whole thing. So, you know, b- believe it or not, people that actually borrowed to invest back then did okay over time because the stock market was actually uh, doing better at that, had higher growth at that time as well, and inter- interest rates came down. So even with higher interest rates in the past, it's basically, uh, it's basically, this strategy is basically always work. So now how high can it go to be worthwhile? So we look at this as called a, like a break-even calculation, right? So now when I do these, I, I, I go under, I use two assumptions. One is usually borrowing to invest. Uh, I only recommend it for 20 years or longer. And the best thing would be you do this for life. So you borrow an amount of money. So I've done this myself. I borrowed a you know, significant amount to invest. My plan is to never, ever pay it down or anything. I'm going to die with it. So all my life, I'm just going to pay interest on this and get a tax deduction. And meanwhile, all these investments grow and, can, and uh, you know, uh, support my lifestyle. So... So that's kind of the that's the more effective way to think of think of it as a as a plan for life. So when I got this break even calculation, I've assumed that it's a loan for a leverage strategy for life, and that it's a pretty tax efficient investment. We we you know we find with most of us if we're investing in you know equity funds or equi- in stock market investments, typically you know let's say one or two percent of the investment is the is the ta- a capital gain that's triggered every year, and only half the gain is taxable. So it is not even though you know stock market grows by 10% a year usually maybe about 1% is what shows on your tax return in a typical year so it's that's uh, it's kind of with that that uh that point of view is where i'm going to show you this break even so now the odds of success so today prime is 5.95% if you borrow on a credit line against your home which is probably the most single most common way to do it that's about half percent higher so you're paying 6.45% so now if you're in a 40% marginal tax bracket that means the interest is costing you 3.9 so it's really not that ridiculously high so to to make money on, on this over time you need an investment that over the long term makes more than 3.9% after tax. And you know what? The stock market has pretty reliably done that over the long term. So it's still not really all that high. So, but, you know, basically is we've helped quite a few people do uh, borrowing to invest, you know, the, using the Smith River strategies, a strategy that we're kind of known for. And we do other kinds of strategies, investment loans. And and I just find that for growth focused people born to invest is a really effective way to do it but we only want to do it if we have a very high chance of success so we we're very careful on who we recommend it to we want to make sure that you're the right kind of people and you know that that it's done in a way that we have the highest chance of success so all right so let's take a little bit more look at the uh, at the break even so this is the break even point Okay, so um, that's, so this is based on, it depends, of course, on what your tax bracket is and what rate of re- investment re- return we use. So um, we use 8 or 10% uh, when we do try to figure out whether this makes sense. Now, 10% is kind of the, you know, the long-term return of the stock market, so about 10, 11, 12% a year, depending on which, um, which market and all that. So let's say we... 10 is maybe what we actually expect as a long-term return. Uh, 8% is kind of a low. I'm going to show you that in a minute, but it's kind of the lowest return of the stock market over 25-year periods in uh, the modern stock market. So that's 8% is one that we're very confident that we should get as a long-term return. 10 is more the average. So, you know, it's uh, we do expect that, but, you know, it could be higher or lower than that. So based on those returns, most of the people that we have uh, that are doing uh, leverage with us are in higher brackets, you know, 30, 40, 50, you know, probably the most common is the 40% bracket. And so here's the break even point. So if you're making 8% on your investments, um, the, the interest rate on the loan can be 13.2%. And then you'd over your 20, 25 years after tax, you'd be breaking even. And with a 10% return, it's about 16%. So, you know, today we're like in the six, six and a half percent range. So we're still a long ways from this. So now my rule of thumb from this, it's based on the, you know, the 40% bracket by general rule of thumb, which is the break-even investment return is two thirds of the interest rate. Okay. So if the interest rate, for example, is 6%, two thirds of that is four. So what, what you need to make, you have an investment that, over the long term makes 4% after tax. It's kind of, that's kind of the return that you need, that you need over the long term with your investment to be able to break even. So two thirds of the interest rate, it's a good, good break even uh, rule of thumb. 
So now this is what I want to show you about the, uh, uh, because you're born to invest, you want to have this confidence that it's going to do well, that your investment will do well over the long term. And this is, you know, this is S&P 500, which we have the longest history. Of. This is 150 years of data. And, um, you know, back here um, uh, for, from the 1800s until the, or so in the early 1900s, the stock market was mostly agricultural stocks and railways. But the modern stock market started around 1930 when they got into manufacturing and and then consumer products and banking and all that kind of stuff. So 25 year periods ended Friday for 1930 ended in the mid 50s, and so we kind of look at this period as the modern stock market. <clears throat> and in the modern stock market, the worst 25 year period was here, which was 7.9 percent a year. So that's kind of what we look at is. 8% a year, even if the stock market the next 25 years is a really bad 25 years, uh, we still are pretty confident we should be able to get at least 8% as a rate of return. So, you know, today we're borrowing at six, the break even point we have to make would be about four, but we're, but you know, we're quite confident we'd make eight over time or 10, you know, or eight as a kind of as a, a minimum. <clears throat> so it still really makes sense at this, at this level. So now there's another point about stocks that's actually really interesting is uh, when there are periods of higher in uh, higher interest rates, as a general rule, stocks do better as well. They also have a higher rate of return. Now, not necessarily right away, but, you know, like if you take you have to always look at these things over a bit longer periods of time. And what's behind it is when interest rates are high, it's usually because inflation is high. So. All right. So now if you look at this, this is 200 year data of of the real return, the, the rate of return of stocks after inflation. So they've averaged basically 7% a year. And notice there's been periods of high and low inflation. You can see that basically with the dollars. See, whenever the dollar is declining a lot, it's a period of high inflation. So, so even though like these periods were here were higher inflation, the stock market still over time, I mean, these are like decades, but over time, the stock market kept up with inflation. And the reason is you're investing in, you know, big, companies that are growing their profits over time. And when there's high inflation, um, that happens, you know, recurrently for a few years, what happens is the companies can raise their prices uh, for the most part by inflation as well. So they raise their, their profits rise faster in higher inflation times as well. So that's part of why, you know, even boring to invest when interest rates are high generally seems to, you know, has worked out in the past as well anyway. So now you need to have the right attitude when 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 you're uh, in, boring to invest, and you know like it's it's a valid question to ask about you know interest rates. Does it really make sense? But the bottom line is you still have to be confident in your strategy. And, you know I've mentioned this in some other talks, but these are you know like um, if you're a fear based person, then boring to invest is probably not the right thing for you. And these are the kind of the things that fear based people do. You know the 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 one worry that we have, the single biggest worry, whenever we talk about born to invest with any client, is do we think they will ever panic and sell at the bottom of the market? Market goes down and they panic and sell. We call that the big mistake. And if we think that you might do that even once in the next 20 years, then, you know, born to invest is probably a bad strategy for you because you can wipe out, you know, 20 years of growth. The market falls 20 or 30 percent, then you sell. And then what's, what's more is now you've you've lost that. You don't, you don't recover it when the, when the market goes back up. You know, we know that every market decline uh, in the, in history, the markets have, have bounced back up. So we know that eventually they're going to go back up. But if you panic and sell, then you don't. So so it's, you know, market timing, you know, uh, investing based on asset allocation and for a yield. And these are kind of the things that fear based people do because they're 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 they don't tolerate the ups and downs of the market, but you need to be able to tolerate that. And that's, you know, that is the growth mindset that makes it makes you an effective person when you're doing leverage. So a growth mindset is people that think long term. They almost always, you know, it's really beneficial to have a financial plan because it helps you think long term. And, you know, successful investing is goal focused. You're, you're working towards a goal. It's not just am I making money or something. You have a specific goal. It keeps you targeted. It keeps and it, and it you know, it helps you make much smarter decisions. And then you got to learn the risk, the skill of a higher risk tolerance. It is a skill that you can learn. And growth focused people tend to have 100% equities, like much more, like have a much more growth oriented portfolio. Uh, leverage is what like most, you know, most wealthy people actually have already borrowed to invest in their business or, or something. It's actually a very common thing. And it's a big part of what makes people wealthy versus versus people who are not. 
Okay. And they look at all market, all market uh, declines or buying opportunities. That's how we always think of it. Anytime the market's down 20% or more, it's a buying opportunity because we know it's going to recover at some point. And the big thing is what's called faith, patience, and, and discipline. That's that's kind of the mindset that you need to be a successful growth investor and, and also to borrow to invest effectively. That's the mindset. So wherever the market is, you just have confidence it's going to be up long term. So, you know, things happen You know, this, uh, uh, in the news and the interest rates and market goes up and down. And, but you know what? You just have faith that you've got solid investments. They're going to grow over time. We can have patience to wait, stay focused on the plan. And that is the attitude, the mindset that makes you an effective uh, growth investor and, that's, and that to make borrowing to invest work for you. So now risk tolerance, this is a learned skill. I've talked about this in other videos, but it really is. Um, you know, like if you go to an advisor there or even a robo advisor, there was these questionnaires. And, and the thing is, is that actually really risk tolerance? Risk tolerance to me, it really what it boils down to one thing. It's the ability to do nothing when your investments go down. Now you think doing nothing should be too hard, right? Then we can always we can all do nothing. We'll probably have a certain skill at that. But you know, when the markets go down, your it's your gut will will um always tries to tell you something. And your gut is just a human gut is almost always wrong. Markets are going down. Mark, you know, your gut seems to tell you, oh, things are going to keep going down. But that's not what happened. They go down and eventually they come back up again. So it's the ability to do nothing. If you can do that, that's really what risk tolerance is. Then you can, you know, stay invested for the long term. Again, that's what you need to do to be successful. So, and how does a growth mindset benefit you? It gives you this, you know, confidence, peace of mind and freedom. You know, just th think of when you're you're born to invest, you're doing it to build up a higher high, higher amount of money. And you think it's why would I why do that? It's you know, it's it, there's risk involved in doing this, and why why would I do this? And and the reason in the end, it's not actually about the money. It's what it does for you in your life. When you've got a large nest egg, it just gives you that confidence. You have confidence in yourself that you can go do what you want. You get freedom to, uh, you know, uh, time freedom because you don't have to work. You can live the lifestyle that you want. You've got peace of mind from security. You know that you always got enough money and you just got this confidence in life. And that's really the reason that, that a strategy like this, like Born to Invest, makes sense. So... Now, um, just a comment about high income people. We've we've uh, we've written plans for quite a few high income people. We've got quite a few high income clients, and is it looks a little different for high income people because like a lot of people may have trouble, you know, just maxing out their RSP. But you know, for the people that are making you know a very high two, three, four, five hundred, seven hundred thousand a year, what happens? RSP is a small number, and they've maxed out RSP. And now you know what? If, if you're especially the worst thing is if you're salaried. If you're self employed and you have a corporation, there's quite a bit of creative tax planning that you can do but if you're self if you're an employee of a company making uh three four five six seven hundred thousand a year then you know, there's there's hardly anything in the way of of tax deductions and you know there are some tax shelters but most of them are really kind of questionable investments and um so it's very it's very hard to find other good tax deductions and so the the very best one really is borrowing to invest so what happens is, so now you can actually, the thing is, there's not a limit to this. You can borrow, you know, wow, there's a limit to what you can borrow. But it's RSP is, if you're making 500000 a year, the maximum RSP you can put in is about 30000 It's not it's actually not actually very much, right, in the, in the scheme of things. But you can borrow to invest um, and have a, you know, and have a higher amount that, that gets you a bigger deduction. And so all the interest that you pay is tax deductible, all right? And... So then if you invest tax efficiently, what's happening is you're getting a big deduction each year and, and most years. So at least for most of our clients, most years, they're getting a, a net savings, a net refund from borrowing to invest because the full interest is tax deductible. And there's not, they don't pay a lot of tax on, on the investments. You get the odd year with a big capital gain, but most years you're getting a tax deduction. And, and you know what? That's even true after they've been borrowing for quite a few years and the investments have gone up a lot and then they retire and they're selling some investments every month to take you know a retirement cash flow even at that point for most of our clients it's it's a net tax savings in most years so this is something that wealthy people can do you can borrow things you have to get into a large amount of money to make this work you borrow a million dollars the interest rate is let's let's say it's six percent that's a sixty thousand dollar tax deduction so it's way more than than uh 
than uh, an RSP contribution, right? So, and so it's and it's a really effective way. Plus, you're you know you're financing. If you put thirty thousand RSP, you have thirty thousand investments. But if you're paying thirty thousand um, uh, interest on an investment loan, it's probably for a five hundred thousand investment loan. You've got five hundred thousand investments working for you. So it's a really much more effective way you know, to build wealth over time because you're getting it. It's a much larger amount of money that's growing and working for you. All right. So th these are, this is what we talked about today. These are all the, uh, the topics that we talked about. Uh, we talked about how to, how to borrow to invest effectively, what happened in past periods, how high can interest rates go, and borrowing to invest is still beneficial. We got talked about the rule of thumb, uh, about the break-even point, uh, what, and we talked about the mindset you need to invest effectively, and you know the best tax deduction for high-income people. That's what we talked about today. So thanks a lot for listening. Um, I, again, my name is Ed Reppel. My blog is Unconventional Wisdom. It's the number one blog in Canada for a financial planner. Uh, Ed, it's edreppel.com. And if you want to talk to us about a potential, you know, potentially working with us, just hit contact and, and request a free 30-minute consultation. And uh, we'll, one of our planners will just call you and have a discussion, just see whether or not we, it makes sense for us to, to work together. So we'll find out what are you looking for and what do we do. So, all right. And also, uh, please like and subscribe to my blog and my YouTube channel. If you subscribe to them, all that means is I, I'm trying to do a video or an article every Thursday and it comes out. And if you subscribe... We don't do any marketing to you at all. All that happens is you'll get my articles and videos directly to your email each week. So thanks a lot for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.